Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the St. Catharines Museum and Well and Canal Center and happy Museum Week. Uh, my name is Adrian. I'm the Visitor Services Coordinator here at the museum. And today I'm going to take you on a tour of Collections A. Right now I'm staying in the library and you can see the door to the archives. We call it Collections A or Archives. Uh, today uh, on Museum Week is hashtag behind the scenes. So uh, what we're going to do is a series of collections tours actually. So we have our Collections A tour at right now, uh, our Collections B tour for big stuff at one o'clock today and our Collections C tour at 3 p.m. So join us right now <laughs> at one and at three for some wonderful collections tours. In addition to uh, collections tours, which some of you might have seen before on our social media, or maybe you've been lucky enough to come in person in the past for a collections tour. We're also going to do live unboxing uh, videos. Uh, at the end of each tour, we'll unbox an artifact to show you, uh, which is really great because you get to see how it's stored and then you also get to see the object. So let's get right into it. Come on into collections A. All right, let's have a quick look around as you come in to Collections A. We're gonna talk about a few of these locations, a few of these things that you can see so far. But for those of you that are familiar with an archive, it's a pretty typical archive. So first we're gonna start off down at one of my favorite objects and one of my favorite archival uh, documents. Everybody knows this. It's our fire insurance plans. And forgive our iPad. There we go. Hopefully I can reach. Oh, I cannot reach. Oh gosh, everything's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so what's really great about the archive and some of our archival documents are these maps. And as you can see from the filing cabinets, we have lots and lots of maps. Let me just see if I can get down here. Nope. Um, and one of my favorite types of maps is the fire insurance plans. And if you look closely, you can see they used to be in a big book, but we've taken them out of the book and encapsulated them in this wonderful plastic so that uh, researchers can come in and use them and touch them and we don't have to worry too much about them, which is great. And of course the fire insurance maps are really, really wonderful, um, a wonderful historical source and almost a snapshot in time of what the city looked like at a particular time. So we love to show people um, the fire insurance plans. And one of the ones that people really like to look at, sorry, is, I think let's go this way, okay. Um, is uh, St. Paul Street. St. Paul Street East. It's a really good shot of downtown in between 1913 and 1923. And the fire insurance maps were uh, really important. Uh, for the insurance industry, of course, because they uh, listed what buildings were made out of. So pink is brick and yellow is wood. It also listed all of the, the water mains and some of the fire hydrants that are around ready for uh, fire suppression. And here's the Canada Haircloth Building, which is now the, can you see it? Okay. Which is now the, um, Brock University, Maryland I. Walker School of Fine and Performing Arts. And if you look really, really closely, you can see they've listed some of the fire suppression things like power water um, and night watchmen and clock uh, nine stations, hourly reports, water pails, and uh, distance from sandpipes, standpipes and hoses as shown. So they all the fire information is on, on there, which is kind of neat. All right, so our maps and blueprints and all sorts of things, as you can see, 
are stored in these neat filing cabinets, these neat flat storage filing cabinets. And everything in our collection, when it gets cataloged, gets um, a barcode so that we can look up the location in the computer, which is really great. So, you know, you go just have a scan of that and get some information without having to, you know, unwrap or open all of these archival documents. Some of, some of the maps are quite old. In fact, some of our maps are the oldest uh, objects in the collection. So it's good that we can just look at it on the computer without having to unwrap it every single time. So lots of different types of maps and blueprints in our collection, and also lots of different storage technique techniques. Uh, we have our flat storage, which I just showed you, but we also have uh, a huge number of rare books, as you can see from the shelf here. Sorry if that's crooked, I'm just working on, here we go, working with our iPad there. All right. So uh, all of these, uh, some of these books, so some, all of these books are rare books, of course, but uh, some of these books are um, family Bibles, especially these big ones. Imagine the big, big family Bibles. We have a couple of blog posts about our family Bibles, as well as an unboxing video of some. And uh, what's really neat about them is that they carry a lot of family information. Um, so very traditional to record births and deaths and that kind of thing in the back pages or the front pages, depending on the Bible, of uh, your family. So in some cases, these are excellent uh, examples of wonderful art, but also a, 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 fa a family tree, essentially. Um, and again, some of the, uh, the Bibles in our collection, the family Bibles, are some of the oldest items in the collection, some dating from the 1780s and 1790s. And um, they're all wrapped here, of course, uh, in acid-free card. And I'll just pick a, <laughs> I'll pick a small one. Uh, this is, oops, oh no. Let me just pick a, pick a very small one. Okay, here is a very small, small teeny tiny Bible, just to give you a sense of how things are stored. So they're Velcroed capped and then folded in card. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the look of these objects. And it's a teeny tiny copy of the New Testament, which I'm holding upside down. And one of the reasons that we use a card like this is to help keep its shape, help protect it from light. And also the card is acid free, which just helps I'm going to put that back later, which helps uh, keep, protect things like leather covers uh, and that kind of thing. Not using acid-free uh, materials uh, is troubling in the long run because we run the risk of leaching and bleeding and that kind of thing, or even drying out the leather. So on, on books or on paper, imagine newspaper dry, uh, drying out, becoming really crumbly, but also yellowing over time. Uh, that is going to happen because that's how newspaper is made. It's made very quickly and it's not meant to last forever. So making newspaper last as long as it can is, is, a, is a, um, a, an important part of the archival uh, protection that we provide in the archives. Another important part of the archives is what we like to call Google in paper form. And the stand won't let me go down any further, but I'll just pull out this drawer here. You can get a sense of, these are family names. You can get a sense of why we call it Google in paper form, because we have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of records of St. Catherine's people, places, uh, art, literature, businesses, agriculture, commerce, uh, family names, as I mentioned, sports, um, another really good spot uh, over here in this filing cabinet uh, that we've been looking at a lot recently is all of our bridges in the city. So we've got files and files and files of bridges. Um, and of course, we've been looking at bridges recently because we just completed our Lego Challenge Bridge Edition, which you can find on our YouTube page. So there's tons and tons of information. Some have 
uh, a few things in them and some have many, many things in them. Some have a lot. And these reference files are really important for researchers, for local historians and for museum staff uh, to find out more. Uh, most reference files have a news article, a lot have emails from former uh, museum staff and researchers or letters, uh, typewritten letters um, from a long time ago so that we can see correspondence between people uh, here at the museum and people maybe donating objects or sharing information. So that's uh, really, really cool. So those reference files, it's kind of like Google. Unfortunately, we can't search on the computer. We have to come in and, and look at them, but uh, that is the, not a problem because of the information that uh, they reveal to us. Another great collection is our growing collection of yearbooks. And sorry for the shaky camera, everybody. Growing collection of yearbooks, which is uh, really, really great to have. We have a number of high school yearbooks from uh, a, number of, a number of years. Some you can see are, are very new. Um, and some are really, really, really old. Some of the first yearbooks date back to the turn of the century as sort of student newspapers or student, um, student uh, publications. Some from collegiate are uh, in downtown St. Catharines are, are quite old. And uh, we have a, a great number of wonderful resources. Uh, most of the old, old ones are located in some of these acid-free files. And then some of the less old ones, these are all a lot more stable. And so for now, they don't need to be covered. Maybe they will eventually, but for now, they don't really need to be covered. Um, and again, you can see the barcode so that it's really possible for us to either just scan or grab the uh, accession number um, and look it up on the computer so that we can really refrain or um, use our use the physical source as, as, less, as least as possible so that we're not pulling these books out every single time we need to get in or have some information. We'll look it up first. Um, just again, it's, it's important to preserve these objects because there's going to be people after us who want to use them. All right. Uh, and then of course we have the biggest section in the archives, which is, and I can't get too far away from the iPad, um, but uh, we have a number of family records. So in all of these boxes, there are a number of things and there's lots of these types of shelves. Uh, there are uh, all sorts of diaries and letters and other types of documents. And I see Sarah's just telling me to wrap it up. So I'm almost there. <laughs> um, you can see from this, this shelf is really people who were involved in the Welling Canal. So if we zoom in, Quickly, you can see things like communication and traffic. Um, and then we get into some family things as well. So uh, the Weller family boxes are here, uh, which is really interesting. And there's some also some merit boxes uh, down on one of the shelves that I can't get to. <laughs> All right, so speaking of family papers and the Weller family, of course, if you know anything about the Welland Ship Canal, you'll know that J.L. Weller was the first superintending uh, engineer uh, of the Welland Canal. And uh, his daughter has a really interesting story. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, try to unbox live her diary from 1914. It's a travel diary and it's kept in an acid-free box. And you can see all of Weller Journal. It's a travel diary from 1914. Her and a couple of friends went to Europe and we have it wrapped in, uh, wrapped in um, tissue here with uh, a string tied to keep the tissue in place. And which again, also helps to keep the structure of the book intact. Uh, we've got our barcode and our accession number. And uh, so this travel diary is really interesting because um, her and a few friends went to Europe in the summer 
of the well, spring really of uh, 1914. So you can see here, I'm just gonna unwrap. We've put the tissue into the cover just to hold it into place. I'm just supporting the book with my other hand here. There we go to make sure. Now, for those wondering, I'm not wearing gloves because we actually know now that uh, clean, dry hands are much better than uh, gloves, uh, the white cotton gloves, because the cotton gloves tend to catch pages. And so you can dog ear or rip them in a not great way. So clean, dry hands are good for archival documents. So we're good. <laughs> you might recognize my thumbs up from our unboxing videos. Um, Anyway, so the diary is really, really interesting because they went to Europe. In fact, they were in Germany uh, at the time the war was declared. And they kind uh, Olive um, records the events leading up to the war. And it's quite interesting with hindsight to, to read their specific experiences in Germany leading up to the war. And in fact, they had to escape Germany uh, in August. Uh, and they took a, a train from... Uh, Munich, where they were, to Lindau in Switzerland, and then to Paris. And the war had already begun, so it was quite a journey. And uh, they made it back to England and were in England until about October when they could get, uh, it took about until October when they could get a ship home to Canada. But what's really cool is that you can see, so she's written my second trip abroad. So she's been, <laughs> she's been to Europe before, which is no surprise for uh, someone of her social status. Her father was, uh, her father and mother were, you know, upper middle class. Uh, so she's been to Europe before, which is really cool. And um, in 1914, but what's really cool is that later on, she went back, hopefully this isn't backwards. I'm just realizing it might be backwards. Um, later on, she went back and wrote back in blue pen later, much later, uh, turned out to be history, which is just really neat. And I won't read you a selection. We, we read selections of Olive's diary quite frequently at uh, Rem Remembrance Day in November. And you can actually find a couple of different blogs and videos on our YouTube page that feature her writing from her journal. But I'll just show the inside of the journal especially for our younger viewers who may not be used to reading cursive. And this is, a, this is pretty good. <laughs> this is excellent, actually. It's very easy to read compared to many other letters and diaries from even earlier. The only trick with Olive is that you can see these little dashes above and these long things above her. Those are her T's. She crosses her T's, that's a T. So she crosses her T down, down the word, which makes it really, really difficult. You can see it up there as well and all over. So her T, there's another one. Her T, you just have to sort of learn the code for Olive's uh, handwriting. It took me a while to figure it out. What are all these dashes? This is so weird. What are these, you know, what are these? She crosses her T's down the line, which, you know, if you're, if you're writing quickly, uh, you know, you might develop that habit of sort of crossing your T or dotting your I, not over the I, but somewhere down the line. So that's really great. All right. So that's our live unboxing and our very brief tour of uh, Collections A. If you're interested in seeing more of our Collections uh, spaces, you can check out some of the other tours on our Facebook page from last year. And uh, feel free to send us any questions you might have and Sarah can pick up those questions on our next uh, live artifact or our collections tour and sort of unboxing uh, at one o'clock. Join us for a tour of collections B. Thank you very much for joining me, everybody from the archives and library at the St. Catharines Museum. Happy Museum Week. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>